Elizabeth, can you tell me where we are right now and why this is a significant place? Well, where we are right now is we're in the room in which the Prime Ministers of the day used to sit. So this is where my boss sat <laughs> when I worked for Whitlam. Um, but, uh, and I, I, I lived in a little office down the hallway, myself and my secretary, tiny little office at the end of the hallway. Um, it was not set up like this in those days, but I think each Prime Minister put his, wanted to put their own imprint on, on the furnishings, etc. But it, where we are is what is really, we're in Old Parliament House. And Old Parliament House to me is a very important building. It's a building unlike New Parliament House, which, which fosters friendship and it minimises conflict and confrontation. And it was a building where you had a huge number of cross-party friendships. And you'd often see somebody sitting in the dining room with, uh, with one or two members of the opposition. And uh, it's, it's a building, I think, which is fitting to become a museum of Australian democracy because this was the essence of democracy, this building. We, um, the people could come in and come out in a way that is very difficult to do. In the new Parliament House, it's in, almost impossible. It's huge and you're only allowed in certain places and so on. And uh, this now is a museum, and a museum that is, is a place that cares for and uh, um, displays and educates about the artefacts of democracy. And in Australia, I think over the last couple of decades, we've been backsliding in our democratic traditions. And I think this is a very good reminder that we once had sets of values that are very different from those we've been living in recent decades. It does have a warm feeling. This room has a lot of wood in it, beautiful books behind you carpet and so forth. Compared to new Parliament House, which is very airy and large and it feels like you can get lost in there, this building doesn't have that feeling and this office certainly doesn't have that feeling. No, no, no. This office is of, well, in, let's go back and talk about this office in my day. This office was somewhere where you didn't just come in and out. This office was somewhere, well, Mr. Whitlam's secretary was most of the time Caroline Summerhays, who lived just outside there. If you wanted to, do, so, to transact some business with, with Whitlam, you'd go to Caroline first and say, is this a good time to go in there? And she'd say, oh, stay away. He's in a foul mood. <laughs> or, yes, sleep in. He's in a good mood. So, so first of all, it was a space that you were a space which was very owned by the Prime Minister and, and he, the mood and his personality, I think. But you used to come in here and once you were in, you were welcomed. And uh, there used to be a, a lounge there with a table in front of it and he would sit there with you on the lounge and you could talk things through. Oh, boss, you know, what about this or what about that or something else? And it was very welcoming. And I think perhaps, perhaps we should, I should point out that beautiful uh, pot over there by Maria Gazard. She was well known in the 70s. That was when she became uh, a household name amongst people who were interested in, in ceramics. And it's typical that it, although that came after Whitlam, he himself had a strong aesthetic and he, he liked to have, be surrounded by fine art, art, sculptures, ceramics. It was good. Yeah, we've got to be very careful in this room. Like, for example, we weren't allowed to use any hairspray or anything <laughs> or put our water bottles down on the table because it's now heritage listed. So I hope that doesn't remind you of your age. <laughs> in your experience, Elizabeth, are people born into a culture of advocacy or is it a learned skill? Well, 
I think the relevant phrase that we want to start with here is my experience, and that is the experience of a woman. Because there are many cultures in the world where women, there's no public space where they can speak out. So they can't even become part of a culture of advocacy. And then there are many other countries or places in which women can speak, but they're not listened to. They're not heard. So to have a culture of ad advocacy, you have to have immense respect for women and women's voices. Otherwise, you have public spaces in which only men feel entitled and empowered to speak with him. And that's part of what we were objecting to, I think, with, with the women's liberation movement. We wanted our voices to be heard. We wanted what we were saying to be listened to. We wanted, uh, we wanted, we were demanding, in fact, that, that, that public spaces become spaces where our voices and our concerns were, were addressed. You were appointed in 1973 by the Whitlam government as the world's first advisor on women's affairs. And I noticed in the movie Brazen Hussies, yes. you said something really interesting, not that you felt this deep passion or that was what you always wanted to do. You felt an obligation to apply for that role. Can yes. you explain that to me? It was almost as if advocacy pushed you. That's interesting, isn't it? Because you asked me a minute ago whether it was learned or a culture. And I think that it was, it is a learned. I think it's both actually, but it's learned to the following extent that by the time Whitlam advertised this job, I had been through one of the toughest schools, training schools for advocacy and protest that existed then and which no longer exists now. And that is the university environment. So in university, you learned how to run meetings, how to debate a position, how to organize protests, how to act on a protest, how to make signs for a protest. We didn't have call flutes. <laughs> we didn't pay $200 each call flute. We went and made the signs. And that was all learnt. So university became a training ground for protests, NGOs also. But then with Howard, when with the abolition of SRC fees, when they're no longer mandatory, all that, that aspect of university life got replaced by neoliberal values. You went to university to get a job. You went to university to make your way in the world, to get a network of friends who were upwardly mobile. But, but we didn't go to university for those reasons. University was a totally different place. So by the time I, I uh, applied for that job with Whitlam, I mean, I'd been marching along the streets, I'd been writing why rape and marriage should be a crime. I had been demonstrating. I mean, I've been to the whole gamut. I, so I, I, um, yes, I mean, I think that, that, uh, that when I look around nowadays, I don't see that same training ground. And I think Australia has suffered because of that. What was it like being a young woman, full of spirit, having done all these big protests and so forth, and then ending up in this youthful Whitlam government? What was it like? Well, I mean, it was exciting. It was challenging. It was exhilarating. It was like being on a roller coaster. But, um, it was, it was quite amazing, I think. I look back on those years and I think heavens above. You know, we were, well, first, first of all, I was a member of the Women's Liberation Movement. So I was used to demonstrating, I was used to street theatre, I was used to all those forms of protest and of airing your grievances and of saying what changes you want to occur. And then 
Whitlam advertised this job. There was a big debate in the women's movement over whether it was better to work inside a bureaucracy or whether it was better to stay outside and kick and scream until it changed. And of course, when Whitlam offered to open the halls of power to the women's liberation movement, he in effect called out bluff. This is so fascinating because I know at the time you really got criticised by the press associated with the women's liberation movement. They thought you should be screaming on the streets and that you're in fact selling out by going into the bureaucracy to make change. How do you look back on that criticism now? Because you did actually affect a lot of change. So I had worked on the outside. Whitlam advertised his job. And I felt it was a challenge to the women's movement, a challenge to individual pe women, whether they were going to say, all right, I'm going to go into the halls of power and see what changes I can bring about. Because this opening has never been made before. Never in, in recorded history had a head of government said, well, come on, come in and tell us what needs to be done. And, uh, and so, so, yes, there was a great deal of criticism in the women's liberation press, but it was over two. One was whether you should stay inside or whether you should go inside or stay outside and kick and scream. And the other was who was I or the person who was to be appoint, appointed? How could any one woman represent the women of Australia in all their diversity? And of course, I didn't represent the women of Australia at all. Now, that, that, um, that dichotomy or that criticism festered for quite a while. And I guess uh, it's important to say that after I resigned from my Whitlam job, I left Australia. I felt I was a, a refugee from the Australian press seeking asylum elsewhere. And I went to work in developing countries on women in development, then on HIV in development. And I didn't come back to Australia until about, until the 2000s. But it's interesting that at the time your colleagues in the women's liberation movement didn't think that you could protest on the outside as well as being on the inside. Well, yes, I think it's important to realise that women we had never been on the inside, which isn't to say, of course, there were women in the bureaucracies, but they hadn't gone into the bureaucracy to bring about changes for women. What we did by going into the bureaucracy was to show that the reform versus revolution debate was a false dichotomy. So with Whitlam's blessing, we set out to instill what we called a revolutionary consciousness within Australians. Or you might say we set out to end patriarchy, to destroy sexism, whichever way you want to put it, but we did call it instilling a revolutionary consciousness. And if you think about that time when you first started in the role, how optimistic were you that it'd be easier to make change and get things done from that role as opposed to screaming on the streets with the placards? You know, I think once I got into the job, I didn't think about it at all. In fact, I think uh, it's funny, but I don't think it ever crossed my mind that I mightn't get things done. I think it was, in one sense, it was clear that a lot of things had to be done. In fact, we, the Women's Liberation Movement had drawn up lists, Well had drawn up lists, the National Council of Women had drawn up lists of policies that had to be put in place for women. CWA had drawn up lists. Everybody had lists. Australia was overflowing with lists of policies needed for women. But nobody had tackled the question of, well, how do we do it? What are the policies that will bring about the outcomes that we really need? And how do we get those policies in place? So firstly, I, I think I didn't have time to think about whether, uh, what changes would, would come about. But I think also, I think there was a feeling that I needed, I think I felt I just needed to be adroit. 
And what do I mean by that? Well, you know, you had to work out what you're going to fight for. And, and we developed a whole theory of that, which we then tabled for International Women's Year. Um, you had to be savvy enough to work the, the halls of power to... It's incredible though, Elizabeth, thinking about that time because I've seen all this footage of you and photographs of you and there's you, yes. very young woman, just completely surrounded by white men in suits. That's right. <laughs> that's right. So that's who you were working with, men, trying to break into this system as the only woman. <laughs> just about. Now, I had gone to school with Caroline Summerhays, who was Whitlam's secretary, so I had a natural ally, and there were other women on Whitlam's staff. But, and I worked predominantly for Whitlam. I think it has to be, that, that is important to say. So whilst you had a bloke's culture here in Parliament House, very definitely, and if you look at the picture of, the, of Whitlam's cabinet, you see the cabinet room just chock-a-block full of men in suits. But nevertheless, my focus was on getting Whitlam to understand what changes we wanted and to understand that no one change was ever going to be sufficient, didn't matter what it was, that we wanted a change across the board in, all the, in the attitudes of all Australians towards women and of women towards themselves. One of the most extraordinary things that happened when you were in that role is that ordinary women took up protests with their pens. That's right. And they were writing to you yes. in floods. Mm -hmm. And the correspondence was absolutely extreme. And I think I read that Whitlam was the only person getting more letters than you. Yep. Yep. How do you think about that now, that everyday women of all stripes wanted to talk to you? Yep. Look, it was Peter Walensky that convinced Goff to, to create a position for somebody from the, the Women's Liberation Movement. And Goff agreed. And, and that, just the mail, the flood of mail itself, bore out the importance of that advice. You know, it was as if a, a wellspring opened up. It was as if suddenly the women of Australia thought, there's somebody there that will listen to what I have to say. And many of them would, would say, I've been writing for years and nobody's done anything about it, but at last I feel there's somebody there that you can do something about it. And so, you know, that, that male, well, in the first year or so of my job, I just travelled all around Australia listening to women and I tried to make it as diverse a group of women as I possibly could. And that combined with the male gave me the set of concerns that were really gnawing away at women's spirit and souls. And it also enabled me to speak, to somehow reflect into the public spaces around here the voices of women, women's concerns. If women were here, this is what they would be yelling for or talking about or agitating towards. You did make a lot of change while you were in the role. Lots of pieces of legislation were passed, for example, to support single mothers, and we could go on and on and on about what you did achieve. But then some change is much slower. So I wonder how you keep persevering for change when it can often be glacial? Well, yes. I mean, change is a funny and slippery business. Some change can occur just by somebody saying, thou shalt, and it is the case. I remember when I was working in Africa on the HIV epidemic, in the very early days of it, and I went out to a rural hospital in Zambia called Chikankata, and the people, it was run by the Salvation Army. And the Salvation Army there took me out to a village. And this village, in this village, there was a tradition 
where the, if, a, if a man died, his brother would have sex with his wife. And in that way, he, he washed the woman free of the former marriage and he then took her on as his wife. And, and the headman of the village had understood how that was spreading the epidemic in his village and he just laid down a law. He said, from now on, we're going to do that ritual differently. The woman will sit on the man's lap and that will achieve the same cleansing as if she had sex with him. And that was the most radical change because those parts of Africa that didn't adopt that change were wiped out. Mm. Whereas those parts, and Zambia was, that from one village it spread to the whole country. By word of mouth, headman to headman, it went on. And so change can be slow or change can be very, very quick. And I don't think you can predict. But to get back to, to your question, um, perseverance. I think if, if you compare those days with, say, the recent March for Justice, it arose, I think, because there was such widespread outrage. I don't think, whilst we, may, whilst we may have been motivated at times by outrage, I think the women's liberation movement was motiv motivated more by, I mean, everything was wrong in the world around us, just about. Everything was gendered and women were oppressed everywhere. And if you allowed yourself to be outraged about one thing, what, what reaction could you have to all the others? So you had, it was a more, you were, I think it was the, the, the range of issues or the range of changes desired was so enormous that you just ploughed on. If you couldn't go there, you'd go down here. Um, and uh, yeah. What changes have you made that you are most proud of? Well, I don't think one person affects change. I think change comes about through teamwork at a particular time in, and through dialogue. So, so there are changes that I was involved in that I'm particularly, that I could single out. And so, for example, I talk about developing a revolutionary consciousness, and we did that through the establishment of the Royal Commission on Human Relations. That was so radical, it's still the only one that's ever been held in the world that we know of. Uh, we did it through our program for International Women's Year. We did it through the Women in Politics Conference. But then particular policies that if I hadn't been around, may not have come into existence, but I don't claim to be the originator of them, was childcare. And that's a very good story. I'll come back to that story because there are other things like the use of MIRS. It was the Whitlam government that introduced something as, as radical as not singling out women's marital status in the way you address them, but allowing women to use MIRS. Now, in South Australia, which was another progressive government, they mandated the use of MIRS. But we made it voluntary. Anybody that wanted not to exhibit a marital status in the way they were addressed could use MIRS. South Australia failed, but we succeeded. Uh, we introduced maternity leave to Commonwealth Public Service and so on. And, um, yeah, so, so child care. Let me just go... Child care, it was 1974 and Whitlam made the, there was an election was called and Whitlam made the decision that he would go back to the people of Australia on the same platform as he had been elected in 1972. And then he took off, he just disappeared. And I'm left down there wondering what on earth I'm going to do. And so I wander out in the corridor and I say to Caroline, I should take a break while well, I can. She said, yes, why don't you go and see such and such? He, he, he's, he, 
that he might know somewhere in his electorate that you can go. So I went to see such and such, and I end up on, on the coast in Queensland. And I flew up there with my daughter and a young friend of hers. We flew up one day, got there late in, in the evening, got up the next morning and I said, come on, let's walk down to the shop and buy the, what we need for breakfast. We were walking along the road and I can still see it. Now. Yeah, there are palms all along <laughs> the side. It's the sea on the other, sand and sea and a road and houses. And we're walking along there and this shape trundles across the road in front of me and I look. I thought, God, I don't believe this. And it was Whitlam. And that was where he, he had to treat up there to prepare for the election. So that was, it was because I ended up on the same beach as Whitlam and I went, I, I thought, I can't let this go. So I went to see him, I said, okay, boss, there is one policy you've got to go, a new policy you've got to go to the election with. And I had been, there had been a, a report tabled in Parliament on preschool. And I point out to, to uh, Whitlam that this was the only policy that he'd gone to the people with that didn't advance, didn't help working women. It helped, it only helped those families where the woman didn't need to work and could therefore take children to sessional preschool. Uh, and that we needed a whole new childcare policy and he agreed. Well done. Yes. I mean, that's changed women's lives since then, yes. hasn't it? Yes. What's the advantage of working inside a government or inside a big body like you have, like the United Nations, to achieve change? What's the advantage? Well, I think, first of all, there are some things that can only be changed from the inside. So the drafting of legislation is an obvious one. But I actually don't think there are any advantages per se I think whether or not you affect change depends on a range of factors. One would be why you go into a bureaucracy. So, so for example, if you go in as to bring about feminist objectives, you, you're not functioning as a bureaucrat. You go in and you go in to speak truth to power. So you must have a sufficiently powerful position to not be trampled into the dust by speaking to us to power. And um, support, do you think? Because it's very hard to go into big bureaucracies, which are, in your case, patriarchal. Yes. As this one lone person. That's right. That's right. So you have to have networks of support, some of which will be inside that organisation, but many of which will be outside. And that's when the reform and revolution, non-dichotomy comes into play because those who are outside kicking and screaming can open up, can make a space broader, wider for public policy. And you can say, look, look, there's obviously a need for change, so let's, let's do something about it. So, so I... I've worked in a number of institutions. So, for example, I took a senior position in the UN Development Program, but that was because I used, I almost nested myself into that bureaucracy. I used that as a safe space from which I went out into the developing world and worked on initially women in development and then HIV in development. Whereas, if I, whereas I also work with USAID in in the old Zaire, and um, and there that was about really doing con consciousness raising within an organisation. If you contrast that with what we've seen quite recently in the news, we've seen lots of protests. You mentioned March for Justice huge anti-vax protests, many other protests. What do you think the function is of protests like that in modern Australia? I think any protest is about 
at least two things. One is airing a grievance. But the other essential role of protest is to educate, is to educate the populace about what your grievance is about. And I think that, I think modern Australia, well, they say that we have more protests now than, we, than ever before. But I'm not sure that, I'm not sure, and that, that could just damn me. I'm not sure that the protests are always effective because um, whilst you have modern technology, modern technology, well, it doesn't, it, it gets the word out. So it causes an assemblage, of big, a big assemblage, lots of people, but it doesn't in itself bring sufficient follow through for effectiveness. Number one. Number two is, where do people get trained in protesting nowadays? I mean, in the last elections, it, I found it very interesting that people went to YouTube to learn what our electoral processes were all about. <laughs> because suddenly, whether you gave first or second preference seemed to be important. And so, and yet, and yet people couldn't, we had terrible arguments over coffee in the early morning about what electoral system worked and how you worked it to bring about the ends. So, but, you know, back in my day, I learned all about electoral systems informally at university. That was part of it being a training ground. If you think about the protests that you were involved in, which protests would be closest to your heart, Elizabeth? Well, it's interesting. The protest that's closest to my, well, probably, I don't know the answer to it, but <laughs> it's a difficult question. But I'm going to say that the protest that has remained very close to my heart since I first started protesting, and I should say here in answer to a previous question that I learned to protest at the knees of my parents. My parents were active reformers. Now, they didn't march, as I did, but they were involved in the trade union movement, in the reform of the Catholic education system and all sorts of other protests, social movements. Um, and they, they held meetings and planned and strategized. So all that I'd... I'd imbibed in my youth. But um, the first real issue was nuclear waste, nuclear disposal and nuclear armament. The British had just had 12, in the 50s, the British had 12, held 12 nuclear tests in Australia. And, uh, and Indigenous people are still suffering because of that. Exactly. And we still haven't answered the question of what we do with our nuclear waste. But nobody is raising it these days. Where are the public intellectuals that raise? Where are the activists that are, are, are focus in on this? Where are the environmentalists who object to the increasing amount of nuclear waste that we're generating in the world without having any ability to dispose of it? It's, it's a long lost and forgotten cause. And the other reason why I like it as a cause, in looking back over it recently, we, I worked as a receptionist in the ANU one period in my life, in the Research School of Physical Sciences, which had, had uh, Oliphant as its head and Titterton as its star performer. And, and that was at the time when the women of Australia were saying, this, this nuclear testing in the Pacific is putting strontium-90 into our children's, into the milk that our children drink, and therefore into the bones of our children. And I, was, I had studied in Oxford. I'd become part of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament and the anti-war movement there. And, and in, in, in the UK, it was more dramatic. The women led the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, and that was around radioactive strontium-90, and the men, the men led the anti-Vietnam War protests. 
And so it was a gendered response, which always existed, but which we didn't see at the time. But that, that whole issue of nuclear armament, nuclear disarmament, really, and waste disposal is one of the first protests I was ever part of and one that I still think we have to fight for and I would like to see us resurrecting. Subscribe to our channel for more seriously interesting videos.